Hello, and welcome back to No Longer Human by Osamu Desai, read by Sleepless Tales. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. So, we're on uh, the third notebook, part one. Let's get started. One of Takayichi's predictions came true. The other went astray. The inglorious prophecy that women would fall for me turned out just as he said, but the happy one, the one that I should certainly become a great artist, failed to materialize. I never managed to become anything more impressive than an unknown, second-rate cartoonist employed by the cheapest magazines. I was expelled from college on account of the incident at Kamakura, and I went to live in a tiny room on the second floor of Flatfish's house. I gathered that minute sums of monies were remitted from home every month for my support, never directly to me, but secretly to Flatfish. They apparently were sent by my brothers without my father's knowledge. That was all. Every other connection with home was severed. Flatfish was invariably in a bad humor. Even if I smiled to make myself agreeable, he would never return the smile. The change in him was so extraordinary as to inspire me with thoughts of how contemptible, or rather, how comic human beings are who can metamorphosize as simply and effortlessly as they turn over their hands. A flatfish seemed to be keeping an eye on me, as if I were very likely to commit suicide. He must have thought that there was some danger I might throw myself into the sea after the woman, but he sternly forbade me to leave the house. Unable to drink or to smoke, I spent my whole days from the moment I got up until I went to bed, trapped in my cubicle of a room, with nothing but old magazines to read. I was leading the life of a half-wit, and I had quite lost even the energy to think of suicide. Flatfish's house was near the Okobu Medical School, the signboard of his shop, which proclaimed in bold letters, Garden of the Green Dragon, Art and Antiques, was the only impressive thing about the place. The shop itself was a long, narrow affair, the dusty interior of which contained nothing but shelf after shelf of useless junk. Needless to say, Flatfish did not depend for a living on the sale of his rubbish. He apparently made his money by performing such services as transferring possessions of the secret property of one client to another to avoid taxes. Flatfish almost never waited in his shop. Usually, he set out early in the morning in a great hurry, his face set in a scowl, leaving a boy of 17 to look after the shop in his absence. Whenever this boy had nothing better to do, he used to play catch in the street with the children of the neighborhood. He seemed to consider the parasite living on the second floor a simpleton, if not an outright lunatic. He used even to address me lectures in the manner of an older and wiser head, Never having been able to argue with anybody, I submissively listened to his words, with a weary, though admiring, expression on my face. I seem to recall having heard long ago from the people at home gossip to the effect that this clerk was an illegitimate son of Flatfish, though the two of them never addressed each other as father and son. There must have been some reason for this, for Flatfish's having remained a bachelor, but I am congenially unable to take such an interest in other people, and I don't know anything beyond what I have stated. However, there was undoubtedly something strangely fish-like about that boy's eyes, leading me to wonder if the gossip might not be true. But if this were the case, this father and son led a remarkably cheerless existence. Sometimes, late at night, they would order noodles from a neighborhood shop, just for the two of them, without inviting me, and they ate in silence, not exchanging so much as a word. The boy almost always prepared the food in Flatfish's house, and three times a day, he'd carry on a separate tray meals for the parasite on the second floor. Flatfish and the boy ate their meals in the dank little room under the stairs, so hurriedly that I could hear the clatter of plates. One evening, Towards the end of March, did Flatfish, had he enjoyed some unexpected financial success? Or did some strategy move him? 
even supposing both these hypotheses were correct, I imagine that there was a number of other reasons besides so obscure in nature that my conjectures could never fathom them. He invited me downstairs to a dinner graced by the rare presence of sake. The host himself was impressed by the unwanted delicacy of sliced tuna, and in his admiring delight, he expansively offered a little sake even to his listless hanger-on. He asked, What do you plan to do? In the future, I mean. I did not answer, but picked up some dried sardines with my chopsticks from a plate on the table. And while I examined the silvery eyes of the little fish, I felt the faint flush of intoxication rise in me. I suddenly became nostalgic for the days when I used to go from bar to bar drinking, and even for Horiki. I yearned with such desperation for freedom that I became weak and tearful. Ever since coming to this house, I lacked all incentive even to play the clown. I had merely lain prostrate under the contemptuous glances of Flatfish and the boy. Flatfish himself seemed disinclined to indulge in long, heart-to-heart -heart talks, and for my part, no desire stirred within me to run after him with complaints. Flatfish pursued his discourse. As things stand, it appears that the suspended sentence passed against you will not count as a criminal record or anything of that sort. So you see, your, your rehabilitation stands entirely on yourself. If you mend your ways and bring me your problems, seriously, I mean, you will certainly see that I, what I can do to help you. Flatfish's manner of speech, uh, no, not only his, but the manner of speech of everybody in the world held strange, elusive complexities, intricately presented with the overtones of vagueness. I have always been baffled by these precautions, so strict as to be useless, and by the intensely irritating little maneuvers surrounding them. In the end, I have felt past caring. I have laughed them away with my clowning, or surrendered to them abjectly with a silent nod of the head in the attitude of defeat. In later years, I came to realize that if Flatfish had at the time presented me with a simple statement of the facts, there'd have been no untoward consequences. But as a result of his unnecessary precautions, or rather, of the incomprehensible vanity and love of appearances of the people of the world, I was subjected to a most dismal set of experiences. How much better things would have been if only Flatfish had said something like this, I'd like you to enter school beginning in the April term. Your family has decided to send you a more adequate allowance once you have entered school. <laughs> Only later did I learn that this, in fact, was the situation. If I had been told that, I should probably have done what Flatfish asked. But thanks to his intolerably prudent, circumlocutious manner of speech, I only felt irritable and this caused the whole course of my life to be altered. If you do not feel like inviting your problems to me, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do for you. <laughs> what kind of problems? I really had no idea what he was driving at. Isn't there something weighing on your heart? Uh, for example? For example, what do you yourself want to do now? Do you think I ought to get a job? <laughs> no. Don't ask me. Tell me what you would really like. B but even supposing I said I wanted to go back to school. Yes, I know. It costs money. But the question is not the money. It's what you feel. <laughs> Why, I wonder, couldn't you have mentioned the simple fact that the money would be forthcoming from home? That one fact would probably have settled my feelings. But I was left in a fog. How was it? Have you anything which might be described as aspirations for the future? I suppose one can't expect people. One helps to understand how difficult it is to help another person. I'm sorry. I'm really worried about you. I'm responsible for you now, and I don't like to think you have such half-hearted feelings. I wish you would show me that you're resolved to make a real effort to turn over a new leaf. If, if for example... You were to come to me to discuss seriously your plans for the future. I would certainly do what I could. But of course, you can't expect to lead your former life of luxury on the help of that poor old flatfish can give. Don't give yourself any illusions of that score. No. 
But if you are resolute in your determinations to begin again afresh and you make definite plans for building your future, I think I might actually be willing to help you rehabilitize your future. Though heaven knows I haven't much help to spare. Do you understand my feelings? What are your plans? Uh, if you don't let me stay here in your house, I'll work. Are you serious? Do you realize that nowadays even graduates of Tokyo Imperial University... D no, I wasn't thinking of getting a job with a company. What then? I want to be a painter. I said this with conviction. What? I can never forget the indescribably crafty shadow that passed over Flatfish's face as he laughed at me, his neck drawn in. It resembled contempt, yet it was different. If the world, like the sea, had depths of a thousand fathoms, this was the kind of weird shadow which might be found hovering here and there at the bottom. It was a laugh which enabled me to catch a glimpse at the very nadir of adult life. He said, There's no point in discussing such a thing. Your feelings are still all up in the air. Think it over. Please, devote this evening to thinking it over seriously. I ran up to the second floor as though driven. But even when I lay in bed, nothing of a particularly constructive nature occurred to me. The next morning, at dawn, I ran away from Flatfish's house. I left behind a note, scrawled in pencil and big letters on my writing pad. I shall return tonight without fail. I am going to discuss my plans for the future with a friend who lives at the address below. Please don't worry about me. I'm telling the truth. I wrote Horiki's name and address and stole out of Flatfish's house. I did not run away because I was mortified at having been lectured by Flatfish. I was, exactly as Flatfish described, a man whose feelings were up in the air, and I had absolutely no idea about the future plans or anything else. Besides, I felt rather sorry for Flatfish that I should be a burden on him, and I found it quite intolerably painful to think that if by some remote chance I felt like bestirring myself to achieve a worthy purpose, I should have to depend on poor old Flatfish to dole out each month the capital needed for my rehabilitation. When I left Flatfish's house, however, I was certainly not seriously entertaining any thought of consulting the likes of Horiki about my future plans. I left the note, hoping thereby to pacify Flatfish for a little while, if only for a split second. I didn't write the note so much out of a detective story stratagem to gain a little more time for my escape, though I must admit that the desire was at least faintly present, as to avoid causing Flatfish a sudden shock which would send him into a state of wild alarm and confusion. I think that might be a somewhat more accurate presentation of my motives. I knew that the facts were certain to be discovered, but I was afraid to state them as they were. One of my tragic flaws was the compulsion to add some sort of embellishment to every situation. A quality which has made people call me, at times, a liar. But I have almost never embellished in order to bring myself any advantage. It was rather that I had a strangulating fear of that cataclysmic change in the atmosphere the instant the flow of a conversation flagged. And even when I knew that it would later turn to be my disadvantage, I frequently felt obliged to add, almost inadvertently, my word of embellishment, out of a desire to please both of my own usual desperate mania for service. This may have been a twisted form of my weakness, an idiocy, but the habit it engendered was taken full advantage of by the so-called honest citizens of the world. That was how I happened to jot down Hariki's name and address, and as they floated up from the distant recesses of my memory. After leaving Flatfish's house, I walked as far as Shinjuku, where I sold the books I had in my pockets. There I stood, uncertainly, utterly at a loss what to do. Though I have always made it my practice to be pleasant to everybody, 
I have not once actually experienced friendship. I have only the most painful recollections of my various acquaintances, with the exception of such companions and pleasure as Horiki. I have frantically played the clown in order to disentangle myself from these painful relationships, only to wear myself out as a result. Even now, it comes as a shock if by chance I notice in the street a face resembling someone I know, however slightly, and I am at once seized by a shivering violent enough to make me dizzy. I know that I am liked by other people too, but it seems to be deficient in the faculty to love others. Yeah, I should add that I have very strong doubts as to whether even human beings really possess this faculty. It was hardly to be expected that someone like myself could ever develop any close friendships. Besides, I lacked even the ability to pay visits. The front door of another person's house terrified me more than the gates of Inferno in The Divine Comedy. And I am not exaggerating when I say that I really felt I could detect within the door the presence of a horrible dragon-like monster writhing there with a dank, raw smell. I had no friends. I had nowhere to go. Horiki. Here was a real case of a true word having been said in chest. I decided to visit Horiki, exactly as I stated in my farewell note to Flatfish. I had never before gone myself to Horiki's house. Usually, I would invite him to my place by telegram when I wanted to see him. And now, however, I doubted whether I could manage the telegraph fee. I also wondered, with the jaundiced intelligence of a man in disgrace, whether Horiki might not refuse to come, even if I telegraphed him. I decided on a visit, the most difficult thing in the world for me. Giving vent to a sigh, I boarded the streetcar. The thought that the only hope left for me in the world was Horiki filled me with the foreboding, dreadful and to send chills up and down my spine. Horiki was at home. He lived in a two-storied house at the end of a dirty alley. Horiki occupied only one medium-sized room on the second floor. Downstairs, his parents and a young workman were busily stitching and pounding strips of cloth to make things for sandals. Horiki showed me that day a new aspect of his city-dweller personality. This was his knowing nature, an egoism so icy, so crafty, that a country boy like myself could only stare with eyes open wide in amazement. He was not a simple, endlessly passive type, like myself. D you? What a surprise. You've been forgiven by your father, have you? Uh, not yet? I was unable to confess that I had run away. In my usual way, I evaded the issue, though I was certain that Horiki, soon, if not immediately, would grasp what had happened. Things will take care of themselves, in one way or another. Look here, it's no laughing matter. Let me give you a word of advice. Stop your foolishness here and now. I've got business today anyways. I'm awfully busy these days. Oh, business? What kind of business? Hey, what are you doing here? Don't tear the thread off the cushion. While we were talking, I had unconsciously been fiddling with and twisting my finger on one of the tassel-like threads which protruded from the corners of the cushion on which I sat. Binding threads, I think they're called. Horiki had assumed a jealous possessiveness about everything in his house, down to the last cushion thread, and he glared at me, seemingly quite unembarrassed by this attitude. When I think of it, Horiki's acquaintanceship with me had cost him nothing. Horiki's aged mother brought in a tray with two dishes of jelly. What have we here? Horiki asked his mother tenderly, in the tones of a truly dutiful son continuing in language so polite it sounded quite unnatural oh i'm sorry have you made jelly that's terrific you shouldn't have bothered i was just going on some business but it would be wicked not to eat your wonderful jelly 
after you've gone all through all this trouble to make it. Thank you so much. Then, turning in my direction. <laughs> How about one for you? Mother made it specially. Ah, this is delicious. <laughs> really terrific. He ate with a gusto. Almost a, a rapture, which did not seem to be altogether play acting. I also spooned my bowl of jelly. It tasted watery. And when I came to the pieces of fruit at the bottom, it was not fruit after all, but a substance I just could not identify. I by no means despised their poverty. At the time, I didn't think that the jelly tasted bad, and I was really grateful for the old woman's kindness. It is true that I do dread poverty, but I do not believe that I have ever despised it. The jelly and the way Horiki rejoiced over it taught me a lesson in the parsimoniousness of the city dweller and in what it really is like in a Tokyo household where the members divide their lives so sharply between what they do at home and what they do on the outside. I was filled with dismay at these signs, and I, a fool rendered incapable by my perpetual flight from human society from distinguishing between at home and on the outside, was the only one completely left out. That I had been deserted, even by Horiki. I should like to record that even as I manipulated the peeling liqueur chopsticks that eat my jelly, I felt unbearably lonely. Uh, I'm sorry, but I've got an appointment today, Horiki said, standing and putting on his jacket. I'm going now. Sorry. At that moment, a woman visitor arrived for Horiki. My fortunes thereby took a sudden turn. Horiki at once became quite animated. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just on my way to, to your place when this fellow dropped in without warning. No, you're not in the way at all. Please, come in. He seemed rattled. I took the cushion from under me and turned it over before handing it to Horiki. But snatching it from my hands, he turned it over once more as he offered it to the woman. There was only that one cushion for guests, besides the cushion Horiki sat on. The woman was a tall, thin person. She declined the cushion and sat demurely in a corner by the door, I listened absent-mindedly to their conversation. The woman, evidently an employee of a magazine publisher, had commissioned an illustration from Horiki and had now come to collect it. We're in a terrible hurry, she explained. It's ready. It's been ready for some time. Here you are. A messenger arrived with a telegram. As Horiki read it, I could see the good spirits on his face turn ugly damn it what have you been up to the telegram was from flatfish you go back at once i ought to take you there myself i suppose but i haven't got that time now imagine a runaway and looking so smug the woman asked where do you live uh, in okubo i answered without thinking that's quite near my office she said. Okie doke, fellas. That's it for this part of No Longer Human. I hope you enjoyed. We didn't get a brilliant much covered today. Um, but we'll finish into the next part, okay? Chapter three. These, this book's been having some long chapters recently, so I'm pacing them out a little bit, all right? Um, anyways, this is Sleepless Tales. Don't forget to like, comment, favorite, and subscribe, and the, and the rest. So uh, have a great night. Bye.